Hi there. In this lesson, we'll write a script to configure the gate the character runs through. We'll change the parameters in the inspector, and the appearance of the gate will change. This is what we'll get in the end. We'll change the color of the gate, and the number that is written on it. We'll also program the gate to make our character wider, thinner, shorter, or taller. Let's start with the script that will be responsible for the appearance of the gate. I go to the scripts folder and create a new C# -sharp script here. Let's call it gate appearance. This is the appearance of the gate. Open the script. Let's do it this way. There is a number written on the gate and the gate has a color. It can be either red or blue depending on the number. If it's a negative number, it'll have a negative effect on the character. In this case, the gate is red. If it's a positive number, the gate is blue. We'll also program the number to change when we change the value in the script. To do this, we need to create new fields for this class. I'll write them now. Note that text mesh pro UGUI is now underlined with red, and so is image. This is because I copied these lines from the file. The libraries didn't load automatically. Hover your cursor here. Visual Studio tells us there's an error here. This light bulb means it has an idea how to solve this error. We need the using TM Pro option. It automatically adds this string to the top of the file. We load a namespace that contains the text mesh pro class and now everything will work. If you create this field while writing the code, it happens automatically. It writes this using string without you even noticing it. But in this case, the string wasn't added. The same goes for the image. Here we need unityengine.ui. There are many namespaces that contain an image class, so it's important to choose this one. It's a fairly common mistake for your object to believe it belongs to the wrong namespace. So look up here and make sure there are no weird bits that you don't understand. If we're using UI, this should say unityengine.ui. And Text Mesh Pro requires importing this. Let's go back to the gate. To change the text, we need a link to the text. It'll be here. Next, the image of the upper part here in the glass. These two images. Then we'll set up the positive and the negative colors. You see, I called them that. They are blue and red. But we might decide later to make the positive color green instead of blue, so it's better to give them less specific names. And the value. It's the number we want to see on the gate. We'll manage it using this parameter. Now let's write that the gate color should change depending on this value. Let's write this directly in the update. If the value is greater than zero, we take our top picture and assign a color to it. Color equals positive color. See? It's more or less the same as the bottom image but it should also be semi-transparent. If you look at its color, it seems to be the same as in the top image. It has this alpha parameter. Let's make it 50%. Now it's semi-transparent. How do we reflect it in the script? Create a new object of the color type. A color has three components, red, green, and blue. Well, for really, red, green, blue, and the alpha channel that determines transparency. Red remains red. Then color positive, green, and blue. All these channels remain the same as in color positive. But its alpha channel will be semi-transparent, 0.5. Here we write the value of each of the channels. We copy the first three channels from this color, and set the value of this channel manually. If you want it to be even more transparent, you can write 0.2 here. It's the transparency percentage. 
In the opposite case, if the value is not greater than zero, if it's less than zero, we need to do the same. But instead of positive color, write negative. That's it. The color will change. Now we also need to change the text on the gate. Take our text mesh pro component and go to its text property. It will equal this value, but we need to render it into a string. That's it. Let's see what it looks like. Add the gate appearance script to the gate and set all the fields for it. Image glass goes here. This is the top image. I didn't give the text a name, and it's already making things pretty inconvenient. Let's call it value. Text value. Let's set the colors. Another very important thing here is that we don't just set the color. We also need to set this alpha value to the maximum, like this, otherwise your color will be transparent. There is the color, and this black slider at the bottom should be set to the maximum. Let's run the game and see what happens. We have a gate here. I change the value. If it's positive, the color is blue. The number changes. If it's negative, the gate turns red. Oh, if it's zero, it's also red now. Well, it doesn't really matter. We probably won't use zero at all. But we're going to work a little more with it now. There's another thing I want to mention. It's not good that we call all these actions in the update, because most of the time your gates don't change. You created them, the game has started, and they will never change. But the code that is written in the update is still called every frame. It's bad because it's not efficient. It's important to avoid the mistake of doing too many things in the update. Every frame, for every gate. So there's an interesting thing I want to tell you. There's a method called onValidate. You can start typing its name here on top and then. Visual Studio provides a suggestion. onValidate is a special method. You can read what it does here. This function is called when values change in the inspector. This is exactly what we need. I want the function to be called when I change a parameter in the inspector. It also says here that the method is only called in the editor. This is also what we need. We don't need these numbers to change during the game. We want to configure them in the editor. So just transfer all the code from the update to onValidate. And let's see what happens. Now we won't even need to click the play button for the script to run. Just change the values in the inspector, and the gate changes automatically. This is very cool, convenient, and productive. Let's also make our script a bit neater. There was a bit of code copying here. And it's not good when you have almost identical strings like these. I'm going to create a method and call it setColor. Let's learn how methods work because there's another thing we need to do. We need our method to accept an argument. The idea is that we call this method and pass a color to it, blue, green, or red, and the method changes the value of the images. First, it assigns the color to the top image and then to the glass one. Like this. I created a variable with the color type inside this method. This is its name. But it could actually be called anything. I just chose this name. The value passed to this method as an argument is assigned to the top and the bottom images in the following way. Now, when we want to assign this color, we call the method and pass the color here. Underscore color positive here and underscore color negative here. It's a convenient and smooth method. This way, we made our code a little shorter and avoided string duplication. It'll be more convenient to work with now. You can do something like this. 
Let's add a check here. We also have the else if operator. We can check what happens if the value is zero. This is how else if works. In the beginning, you check this condition. If it's true, this color is assigned. If it's not, we check whether this condition is true. If it's not true either, we move on to the last condition. If the value is zero, let's make the color gray. Set color. Unity has prefabricated colors. For example, you can create the gray color like this, color.gray. Now, when the value is zero, the gate will turn gray. Let's make sure everything still works. Save the script. We don't need to click play now. We just change the number in the inspector. Everything works. If you select zero, the gate is gray. There's one problem with what we've done. Negative numbers have a minus sign, see? I want positive numbers to have a plus sign in front of them. Let's make this perfect. Like this, for example. Add a new value, string, I'll call it, prefix. This is what will be written in front of the number. You can assign a value to it. I write empty quotes here. This means there is no prefix initially. Then I move this line down, and we need to add a value to the prefix, like this. Right, first goes this prefix and then the value. If the value is greater than zero, the prefix equals plus. And if the value is not greater than zero, if it's zero or negative, the prefix won't change. There'll be an empty string, and it'll remain as it is. There's a detail I haven't mentioned yet. When I create fields in the inspector, I write their names with an underscore. What does that mean? If you remove the underscore or write it in any other way, it'll work anyway. These are just the code naming rules that I adhere to. Code writing standards are different and may vary in different companies. The most common one is when you write private fields like this with an underscore. If the field is public, like this, we write it with a capital letter and without an underscore. If it's not a field but a variable that you create inside a method, that is executed and then disappears. We write such fields without underscores or capital letters. This way, we can navigate the code easily and immediately tell what a variable is by its name. We're done with the color, the number changes, and the plus sign is added. Now let's take care of these icons displayed at the top. I'll hide them all for now. There's something else I want to explain. As we created objects and studied their components, you might have noticed that some of the properties have several options. Like, for example, the type of light source. There are several different types. But how do we create a choice like this ourselves? For example, now there are at least two options I want to have for the gates. What will they be like? They affect the width or the height. How do we create a drop-down list like this in which we can choose one or the other? To do this, you need enum. It's a C-sharp property for choosing one of the options. We need to call it something. I think deformation type is a good name for the type of deformation. Now curly brackets, and inside them, we write the names. Let's say the first one will be the width, then a comma, and then height. We also need to make it public. Public enum. Note that I am not writing this inside the class but outside. This means that this object will be available everywhere. In fact, we created a new data type. It doesn't matter that it's written in this particular class. It makes sense to put it there. But if you make an object public and write it outside of the class, then it's available throughout the project. You can use it anywhere. We announced this class, 
and now we need to create a variable of this type inside the gate appearance object. I'll add a new field here. Let's call it deformation. As it's of the deformation type, we don't have to think too much and can just call it the same thing, with an underscore and a small letter. What's next? Let's see what it looks like in Unity right now. A new field has appeared in the inspector where we can choose one of the two options. You can add the third one, if you want, but I have no idea what it can do. Maybe it can deform the character in the fourth dimension. Now let's make the deformation type determine which icon we see. The one for increasing the width or the height. To do this, we need to add new fields. Here they are. These are the game objects of these icons. Expand, shrink up, and down. Let's add them all to the inspector. We created them here during the previous lesson. Now let's continue to write this logic in the onValidate method. I'm going to write it down here. If underscore deformation type equals equals deformation type width. We're comparing it now to find out what it's equal to. Then we do one thing. If it doesn't equal width, we do another thing. If one day we come up with a third option, let's write this string so that nothing breaks down here, else if underscore deformation type equals equals deformation type height. As there are only two options, it's either one or the other, so you don't have to add else if, but I'm going to add it just in case. We have four icons that can be displayed. If the deformation type is changing the character's width, we need to check the value. If the value is greater than zero, we display one icon. And if it's less than zero, we display a different one. The same condition applies here. Now let's write what exactly should be enabled. First, let's disable all these icons in the very beginning of the script. I'm writing underscore expand label dot set active false. Then underscore shrink label dot set active false. And it goes like this for all the icons. If it's the width icon and the value is greater than zero, we enable this icon. If it's less than zero, set the value to true to enable the shrinking icon, this one. This one here. Be careful. We disabled them all there, and here we enable one of the icons depending on the condition. Basically, that's it. Let's see if the code works. I added everything. Right, great. The deformation type is height, and the arrow points up. If the value is negative, the arrow points down. The shrinking icon is shown for the negative value, and the expansion icon for the positive value. Everything's perfect. I should also note we used a new operator here, equals equals. We have two different actions in C-sharp. The first is when we write the equal sign. That means this text is equal to this. It's an assignment operator. A single equal sign is an assignment operator. By using it, we assign this value to this unit. However, this operator is a comparison. They are completely different. Here we want to see whether a value is greater, less than, or equal to something. This is what the double equal sign is used for. Be careful not to make a mistake here. Finally, I suggest making our project a tad neater. This script turned out to be quite large. It's responsible both for the visual part and the gate's behavior its value and deformation type. It's good practice to separate the game's visual part from the game logic. Later we'll also need to write how the gates interact with the character. So more code will be added here. So let's isolate the part that is responsible for the visual effects. To a separate class. I'll create a new c -sharp script and call it gate. I'll add it to our gate object. Like this. Now let's get everything. That is not related to the visual effects out of the gate appearance class. It's the value and deformation type. The rest is colors, objects, icons, texts. All those things are responsible for the visual part. Then we'll move these fields to the script with the gate. And add the link to the gate appearance script to the gate script. 
let's add an underscore to its name. But now our gate appearance script will have errors, because it doesn't know what a value or a deformation type is. So this is what we'll do. Let's replace the onValidate method with another one. Let's call it update visual. It's the name I use, but you can call it something else. As an argument, it will take the type of gate. Deformation type. The type of gate deformation. And then, in value. The idea is for this method to be called from here. Now I'll create the onValidate method here. And gate appearance will. This method should be public so that we can call it from other scripts. Public. Update visual. Now let's pass the underscore deformation type and underscore value values here. List them in the order they are written here. Right. As we change colors, we already saw methods that took an argument. Set color here takes a color and then uses it. Same thing here. We call the method, which takes deformation type, and uses it here. Just remove underscores here. I hope what we did is more or less clear. The key thing is that we call a method from one script in another script. We pass the value in this method, and the method uses it. This is important because now our gate script is simple and neat. It has underscore value, underscore deformation type, and nothing more. It's responsible exclusively for logic. Gate appearance, on the other hand, is responsible for the visual effects, and we don't really need to change anything in it in our following lessons. Let's make sure everything still works. Let's add the link to it and check. We change the value here and everything works, and this also works great. Let's go over the key points from the lesson once again. The onValidate method is called when changes occur in the object's inspector. It also works in edit mode. If you need a variable that is a choice of several options, use enum for this. For example, enum will be used for the cardinal directions and always separate the code responsible for the appearance from the code that affects the gameplay. 